Well, good afternoon or evening. I've lost track. Um, first of all, a, a warm thank you to Brian and Kathy and the uh, folks at BioForward for hosting me today. It's really um, a great opportunity to get out into the trenches where really smart, thoughtful, innovative people are developing products that are going to help the patients we all care about. And, and as we've looked at the way FDA and, and the device center in particular does business, one of the uh, goals we had set was to get out into the community and to try to better understand what the challenges were that were being faced by uh, people trying to develop these products and get them to market. And, and in particular, to look for areas in the country where there was that key uh, collaboration going on, where academia and industry and government and, uh, were working together to try to uh, raise the water level, if you will, to try to really bring these products along. And, and as we looked around, we identified this, this area, Madison and Wisconsin in general, as an area where that uh, was going on. And so we really wanted to get out here and, and hear from people about, about that. What, what I'd like to uh, talk about this evening is uh, our, what, what's happened with us, with FDA and the Device Center over the last 18 months or so, how we're thinking about medical device product innovation, uh, and the role that regulatory science plays in helping to bring new important products to market. So the Device Center uh, at FDA regulates a wide variety of products and, and they vary from very simple things like tongue depressors to very complicated things like implantable pacemakers and defibrillators. We regulate radiation emitting products like CT scanners and MRIs, but also non-medical radiation emitting products like microwave ovens and uh, scanners at airports. So we have a, a very broad portfolio of products. Uh, under our purview are also diagnostic tests, so blood tests that you might perform, genetic testing. All of those sorts of tests are uh, considered devices and regulated by us. And so what you can immediately see is we have a huge array of products, we need a huge amount of scientific expertise. Uh, it's unrealistic for us to think that we're going to have the world's expertise in every area for every product. And so one of the things uh, we've been trying to do is to reach out to the community when we have uh, questions. We want to understand what the challenges are for people who are developing products, uh, their understanding of the science, and, and build more of a collaborative approach to our product evaluations. We see about uh, 4,000 new medical device products each year. Um, so there's a huge volume of products that go on. Not every single one of those is incredibly uh, game-changing and, and uh, incredibly innovative, uh, but they are iterative Im improvements in devices and certainly is um, a very important industry in the U.S. Well, one of the important messages, and people who develop devices know this, but devices are not drugs. Uh, that's an obvious statement, but there, we really need to think about them very differently. The model for development of devices is very different than drugs. The types of companies that are developing devices are very different than drugs. Um, and uh, here are some key differences. Probably the most important difference is the rate of technology change. The lifespan of a device on the market is extremely short. I mean, measured in months, really. 18 months, 36 months. There are iterations and changes in models, but if, if we have a, a really slow evaluation process at the FDA, you're going to be uh, putting, you know, devices from four generations ago into patients because the technology is, ev is evolving so quickly. So we need to be uh, rapid in our assessment and evaluation of these technologies. Uh, in addition, the evaluation for a device is very different than a drug. In a drug, you really need to do a clinical trial, and so there's a very well Describe process for going from the bench to animals to small human trials to larger human trials. And devices, that paradigm doesn't work. Uh, there are many great tests we can do on a bench top, uh, electrical tests that we can do sometimes that allow us to test a device better than we could test it in a clinical trial or into, in a human. For example, we can test devices to failure on a bench top. We can see how much pressure they can take if we're doing a repetitive motion test, we can do it over and over and over again until a product breaks. We can't do that in a clinical trial. And so as we think about how to evaluate devices, we need to leverage those tools available to us. And developing new tools to test devices on a bench top, particularly for new technologies, is a really key component to getting these technologies to market quickly and not having to wait for very long 
clinical trials. Well, I'm a cardiologist, so I like to put up heart-related medications and devices, and, and here's one heart-related medication. This is called Captopril. It's a blood pressure pill and a, and a medication to treat heart failure. And it was approved by the FDA in June 1981, and if you went out to your local pharmacy and bought Captopril, it's exactly the same molecule 30 years later. We know a lot about the, the product. It's been given to tens of millions of patients. It would be extremely surprising to learn anything new about this product. Uh, adverse events are well understood. We understand the rates of adverse events. It's just we know a lot about it. Compare that to an implantable defibrillator. This is over a shorter period of time. This is over about a 20, 22 year time period. The size of the device decreased eightfold. The amount of computer memory uh, exponentially increased. The capabilities of the device exponentially increased. We cannot think about drugs and devices the same way. We need a different paradigm, a different way of evaluating these products, and the development of these products is very different. So the, the fundamental challenge for us is to facilitate the development of these innovative products and bring important good, safe products to market, <coughs> excuse me, uh, while assuring the safety and effectiveness of the devices. And on top of that fundamental challenge <coughs> is that science is constantly changing, technologies are evolving. Uh, we learn more and more about science and, and devices. They're becoming more complex. And fundamentally, the regulatory pathways were established in 1976 uh, before many of these technologies were even conceived of. So we need to figure out a way to navigate this landscape. There's some pretty amazing innovative technologies that are being developed. I put, a, I put a few down on this list, but it's certainly not a comprehensive list. Automated technologies, robotics, uh, miniaturized devices, the, the use of devices outside the hospital, uh, products that combine devices with drugs, uh, wireless communication, uh, really just an incredible array of technologies and devices that are being developed. And the delivery of healthcare is changing. We're not just, it's not the same old, same old. It's not patients go to the hospital, stay in the hospital till they're better and go home. A lot of these technologies and devices are taking advantage of trying to save costs, trying to get patients out of the hospital sooner doing minimally invasive procedures and surgeries to shorten the time in the hospital, uh, communicating with data and information that we never knew we could even get, wireless communication, implantable monitors and sensors. So we need to adapt to this changing, changing landscape. Uh, and here's one example of the challenge that we face at FDA, which are mobile apps. You know, probably 99% of us are sitting with a phone in our pocket here in this room, some pretty amazing applications that can be put onto the phone, well, it turns out that some of those applications can turn your phone into a medical device. There are sensors that can make, turn a phone into an EKG machine. Uh, there are uh, sensors coming, you know, it's not hard to imagine someday you'll have an ultrasound machine. A physician could walk into a room, do an EKG, do an ultrasound, uh, send it off to the patient's medical record, download their next patient's information. I mean, the world of healthcare is changing. And so when we think about how, what are we going to do at FDA about this, and particularly in a down economy when the mobile app uh, world is one of the few burgeoning uh, areas, we certainly don't want to stifle that. And when there's going to be hundreds of millions of users of these apps throughout the, uh, throughout the country and the world in the very near future. And so we took uh, what we thought was a balanced approach. We want to provide clarity and consistency. We want people to understand when they need to come to us, when they don't need to come to us. And for the vast majority of mobile healthcare apps, we don't want to be involved. We don't need to be involved. If they're uh, consumer wellness kind of apps and there's no major implications for health or safety of the patient, then that's certainly not something that we need to get involved with. Here's one of the uh, first apps that we dealt with, which was a mobile app which allowed a radiologist, a doctor, to look at healthcare images on their smartphone rather than sitting in a dark room and reading a radiology image. And on the surface, it may not seem like that big of a deal, but if it's your CT scan and your radiologist is on the 18th tee 
uh, looking at your, your scan for your lung tumor on his smartphone, we want to make sure he can see it. And so for this type of device, we simply required, asked the manufacturer to develop a tool that made sure that the contrast differentiation on the phone, uh, that the, the visual acuity on the phone was sufficient, and so the user simply taps a couple of squares to demonstrate that they can see the contrast difference that's sufficient to read images, and then they're good to go. So this is not meant to be uh, over-regulatory, but just to protect patients and make sure that the appropriate safety features are in place. Another uh, mobile app we saw relates to uh, diabetic patients being able to hook up their glucose meter uh, to their smartphone so that they can use their smartphone as the interface with the device. Um, and for that type of thing, all we required was that the manufacturer was able to show that they could clean their smartphone appropriately and get rid of all the blood so that patients weren't get uh, contaminated from other people's uh, blood. So we're trying to be smart in how we regulate some of these new technologies. Uh, other challenges are created. I already alluded to wireless technologies. There are implantable devices that can automatically communicate wirelessly, can send email alerts and uh, internet uh, uh, connectivity to your doctor's office so that they log on to the computer and get something out of your body, measurements and data from your body into their desktop. So really revolutionary type of um, ideas. Well, another fundamental challenge for us at FDA and for the community is that the vast majority of innovative medical device companies are really small. This shows the overall medical device a size for, there's about 16,000 devices that are registered with FDA, and 70% of them have fewer than 10 employees. That's vastly different than what the drug community looks like. So we are dealing with a large number of very small, innovative companies that are trying, many times, trying to bring their first product ever to market. And so that creates a challenge for them. It also creates a challenge for us because sometimes, oftentimes, we're dealing with people who lack the expertise and who maybe haven't been there before. And so as we talk about how, what can we do to help bring innovation and get products to market more quickly, this is certainly one of the challenges. Well, uh, as we started thinking about uh, how could we help, uh, obviously FDA is an imp has an important role in fostering innovation. Uh, we're not the only role. I mean, we could... Uh, be gone tomorrow when there still are challenges, obviously, for these companies in getting their products to market. But we're certainly, we acknowledge and recognize that we play an important role. And we can, we can help, and we want to help. And so we identified three key areas that we thought uh, we could help with. And we uh, put these out earlier this year and have been working to try to um, foster these areas. One of them relates to uh, coming up with new mechanisms, new regulatory pathways in our product evaluation. So a company comes in with a new device, we want to get it out quickly. The second uh, relates to strengthening the underlying U.S. research infrastructure and regulatory science. There's a lot of concern that the U.S. is losing its leadership position in the medical device development area. We are number one in the world, we've remained number one, uh, but with the economy the way it is and it's cheaper sometimes to do trials and to start devices and get on the market uh, in Europe or other areas like China uh, more quickly. Uh, some of that business is moving overseas. And we want to be prepared when new technologies come across our desks. <coughs> we don't want to be surprised when we see them. <coughs> so one of the uh, programs we put in place is called the Innovation Pathway. And uh, on the left, on my left, your right is, um, well, I guess it's your left too. On the left is the, um, the standard pathway for uh, product evaluation at FDA. A company comes in, uh, they may interact during what's called a pre-IDE, an IDE is an investigational device exemption, a research protocol. Um, typically though, the, the major interaction comes in after the company's already gone through their research and is ready to come in and submit their regulatory submission, and then we start expending more of our energy and effort to evaluate the data and the, and the work that's already been done. We thought that was getting involved too late. We feel that if we can be involved earlier in the process for a company, try to provide better clarity about what they're gonna need to bring to the table, try to identify the scientific barriers that are gonna stand in the way between their product and successful marketing of their product, um, that that would be a more efficient use 
of our time in a, in a better process for the company so that we could shorten that time to market. The Innovation Pathway uh, is a pilot program. We're just doing a few devices. The idea is that we want to try it out, see if it's successful, and then we would apply the lessons learned more broadly to some of the other areas, some of the other review programs that we have. The first device we accepted into the Innovation Pathway is a pretty amazing prosthetic arm. Not only is the prosthetic arm itself amazing, uh, but it's controlled by an implanted sensor that goes on the brain. And so the, a sensor gets placed on the patient's brain. Uh, it, it, just by the patient thinking, it, the sensor recognizes the activity of the brain waves, the electrical activity, and controls the arm. And so it would really revolutionize the care of patients, of our soldiers who've been uh, harmed overseas, of patients who have had traumatic injuries, quadriplegic patients, to, for them to be able to think again. These, Devices have been implanted in primates, uh, and the primate can learn to use the, the arm simply by thinking. It's really pretty amazing technology and would really revolutionize the care of these type of patients. But these are the type of products that we really think uh, we want to help and we want to uh, get them to market as soon as possible. Well, in the device world, uh, there are uh, several key stages, and having a good idea obviously isn't enough. You need an idea, and then you start building prototypes of the device and, and start preclinical and clinical testing. And one of the things we heard from the venture community and from entrepreneurs who were uh, starting early in their device development process was the trouble in getting their device from the bench top and from their early iterations into humans, into those first human trials, which is a major milestone for these companies and, and what really brings in additional investment. And so we focused on those areas and developed some uh, early feasibility first in human uh, guidances that would allow uh, uh, companies to put their products into patients safely but earlier, changing our policies a little bit, uh, thinking more about the benefit risk of getting these products to market so that we can uh, continue to foster the development of these products and get them out as quickly as possible. Well, the other, one of the other pillars of the innovation initiative relates to regulatory science, and that's a phrase uh, if you haven't heard, you'll hear more of, but regulatory science is the science of developing new tools and standards uh, and uh, developing approaches to assess the safety and efficacy, but also the quality and performance of FDA products. I'm going to talk about it in the world of devices, but it applies broadly as well to drugs and other product areas. Here are some examples of regulatory science. Uh, regulatory science includes looking at how uh, devices or materials interact with the body. We um, have, uh, the, with the development of things like nanotechnology or other new biomaterials, there's a, a certain uh, science there that needs to be evaluated. Developing test methods so that we can test uh, the devices more easily without needing clinical trials. Uh, looking at causes of failure epidemiology methods, post-market studies, all of these fall under regulatory science. But the bottom line is that the idea is that the benefits uh, of this it, is that it reduces time and resources needed by device developing companies uh, to get the products to market quicker, to have smaller clinical trials or no clinical trials. And this is uh, one of the areas um, that we've been trying to find uh, places around the country who are capable of doing this type of research. We do some regulatory science research, which I'll touch on, but it's also an area where it requires uh, collaboration among industry, uh, stakeholders, nonprofit organizations, academia. Uh, we, we can't do this alone. Historically, the um, approach to device evaluation has relied on bench testing, animal testing, and clinical data. And as one example of regulatory science that we think could help is computational modeling. So this is an area that's not that well developed. Uh, we have approved some devices based on computational modeling. For example, we have a, a MRI compatible pacemaker uh, where we evaluated the product primarily by looking at modeling of the MRI field and how it would interact with the pacemaker. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunity here. One example would be uh, developing computational modeling or simulation of certain coronary uh, anatomy, whether it be the coronary vessels. On the uh, right over here, I have a, a diagram of the aorta, 
So if we created an image library for an aorta and the company wanted to develop an aortic aneurysm stent uh, that can go in, then if we, uh, they could cut down on their device development time by having access to a library of images of normal people, a library of images of people with aneurysms, so that it would, uh, again, shorten the time to market and make it more efficient for everyone. We've identified four areas that we're going to focus on as far as computational modeling, and we'll, we've already uh, established a public-private partnership with a group, uh, Life Science Alley in Minnesota, but it's not uh, necessarily limited to that geography, and we're certainly looking for other uh, geographies and areas where we can do other projects. But part of the computational modeling that, that we've prioritized are developing computational modeling for the heart, so a virtual human heart that would allow uh, assist device development for valves and, and other uh, heart assist devices, the peripheral vasculature, the brain, the model mind, if you will, for neurosurgical uh, tools, and uh, the bony body, so the skeletal system to help expedite the development of joint replacements. We have a number of uh, specific uh, projects that we have worked on and collaborated with other stakeholders. Here's an example of one trying to uh, quantify the response uh, with phantom studies, so looking at putting phantoms, uh, like the ones you see down on the bottom here, uh, into uh, CT scanners and other scanners to try to determine whether the software or a new scanner is capable of detecting what we want it to detect. So that rather than uh, hoping that, th that the new device is doing what we think, we can actually measure and, and determine if the software is sensitive enough and if the algorithms in are doing what they're supposed to be. Here's some phantom testing for the retina. <coughs> uh, up on the top is an actual uh, optical coherence tomography of a retina, and then down at the bottom is this silicone phantom that mimics the retina. And so, again, this is a diagnostic test, a diagnostic study, but we can save a lot of time and make it a much easier to evaluate the product by developing models like this that allow us to uh, reproduce or recreate the challenges that would be seen clinically and can sh uh, shorten the time of product evaluation. Well, one of the other areas of great interest, both, both to us but also to uh, payers, is the idea of personalized medicine. So we're getting much better at doing things like genetic testing, uh, of trying to identify patients that will benefit from an individual therapy. So rather than treating 100 patients and trying to get the 50 that are going to benefit from the therapy, trying to identify the patients ahead of time so that they get the, the right therapy at the right time. And as an example, many common drugs that are used are given to many people but only help a few. So when you look at things like hypertension drugs or uh, heart failure drugs, cholesterol drugs, et cetera, there's, very, there's an, a number of patients who get exposed to the toxicities of the drugs and will never experience a benefit. So personalized medicine speaks to trying to identify those patients ahead of time that are going to be the responders. And on the other side, uh, ineffective therapies can cause harm, but there's also sometimes patients who are more likely to experience an adverse event. So if we can identify those patients ahead of time, then we can keep them, uh, keep those patients from being exposed to a harmful therapy. Uh, in vitro diagnostics or point of care diagnostics are going to be a key component of personalized medicine. There are many in vitro diagnostic tests, genetic tests, uh, tests to check for certain protein anomalies in patients with cancer that are going to uh, determine whether a patient is a candidate or likely to respond to a given therapy. Uh, we have been collaborating within FDA. We've developed something called companion diagnostics. So it's a diagnostic test that goes along with the drug therapy. So for example, for chemotherapy for a certain type of cancer, uh, you might have a diagnostic test that uh, will uh, identify patients who are likely to respond to a certain therapy and then you'd want to give them that therapy. But certainly we start seeing more and more of these type of diagnostics. There's some incredible technologies that will allow diagnostic testing of multiple tests on a, give, on a single chip. Uh, we're going to understand genetic anomalies much better and much more, and quite frankly, we're going to have a lot of information and not know what to do with it. Uh, we're going to have a lot of genetic results, a lot of test results, 
and we may not fully understand the implications of those results at the time that we're able to, to get them. Well, for, for a drug, uh, often there's talk of patient compliance. How often does the patient actually swallow the pill? Um, for, there's no, uh, I would say the analogous piece of that for devices relates to human factors. How does the person using the device or the healthcare, per, uh, healthcare giver, the patient, how do they interact with that device? And this interaction is called human factors. It's been very well studied in many other fields, so your interaction with your computer, uh, Apple is famous for doing this, to trying to develop uh, products that are easy to use, that make sense. Uh, we've seen bad designs that have important patient implications, products that are designed, uh, for example, an external defibrillator, where the button to defibrillate is right next to the button to turn the device off. So think about what do you think happened every once in a while under an emergent situation. People were turning the device off. It takes about a minute to get turned back on again. So, uh, so companies and innovators need to think about human factors in their designs. We've seen it for infusion pumps, which are devices which are used to deliver uh, uh, fluid or medication to patients at precise amounts where the, the, uh, it would allow uh, multiple uh, unrealistic amounts of fluid or medication to be infused uh, and not issue a warning or stop patients, uh, stop the nurse or the physician from programming it that way. So well, we've started a human factors laboratory. Uh, this is something that uh, companies who are developing products that rely on patient and uh, clinician interaction need to think about. Well, fundamentally, one of the other challenges we face in addition to the, the bad economy and the lack of investment in medical device regulatory science is the historic um, way the government has invested their resources. And so this shows, this is from the National Science Board Science and Engineering Indicators published in 2010, but this is data from uh, 2008 <coughs> that shows for example, how HHS, Health and Human Services, of which FDA is a part, uh, has invested their money. And there's been a, uh, most of their nearly $30 billion has been invested in life sciences, which is another way of saying drug development. These fundamental uh, disease-based uh, studies. And very little has been invested in engineering, which is where a lot of the device type of research goes. And in fact, if you look at the engineering, a lot of the funding government funding comes from the Department of Defense, NASA, and places like that. So uh, this is a fundamental issue and challenge for, uh, for us and for the community that's trying to help move the needle forward and develop innovative technologies in the device space. So just to put these numbers in a little more context, in FY 2011, NIH's budget for research was over $30 billion. And during that same year, our budget for medical device regulatory science was about $15 million. So uh, we recognize that it's probably not going to be us doing a lot of the research, but it doesn't mean that we can't participate. It doesn't mean that we can't provide our expertise, but we are going to need to rely on other sources and other uh, areas for advancing this area. Well, it's also interesting when you look at what are other countries doing as far as investments in research and development. And this shows you, if you look at the United States in the middle, this is over about a 10-year period from 1996 to 2007. We pretty, mu pretty steady around 2.5 or 2.6 percent of our GDP was invested in R&D in the life sciences. But when you look at other countries like Japan and <coughs> South Korea and China, they're all going up. They all uh, recognize the importance of these, uh, these fields and these areas. And this is a fundamental issue. It, and as you know, I mean, research doesn't immediately turn into products or technology advancement, but it does over a decade. And so uh, we need to think very carefully about how we want to be spending our resources and how, uh, what investments we want to make if we want to maintain our leadership in this area. So a as I've alluded to, I think fundamentally we recognize that we can't do this alone and that we need the community of uh, in uh, investors and community of entrepreneurs and innovators, the academic community, the scientists, uh, government, local government, to really work together to try to identify uh, key areas where we can collaborate, uh, bring uh, 
uh, stakeholders together. We've done this over the last year in numerous places uh, that have started yielding uh, successful results. Some of these have been through formal agreements between FDA and other uh, organizations uh, creating public-private partnerships. And then finally, we also, as I, as I mentioned, recognize that uh, because of our resource limitations, we're not ever going to have all the expertise we need with the broad array of devices and products that we regulate, with the emerging technologies. Uh, we need help and access to people who are knowledgeable. And so we've created a network of experts. We've had a number of other tools, but they've all been somewhat limited by conflict of interest uh, rules that make it very difficult for us to get access to the knowledgeable people. And we recognize that oftentimes the people who know the most about the technologies or products or questions we have are people out in industry or out in other uh, academic areas that are very knowledgeable about these products. So our network of experts is designed to provide our staff easy and ready access to people uh, in the community who are very knowledgeable about, uh, about these people. So that's a, a whirlwind tour of uh, some of the things we've been thinking about and activities. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, the, the rapidly evolving science, the increasing device complexity, uh, the economic challenges uh, really create uh, a, a challenging environment for uh, companies that are trying to innovate and, and bring new products to market. We're uh, trying to help and certainly open to hearing about uh, other ideas if you have them. So I'll stop there and I'd be happy to take any questions or comments from the audience. Um, I can, I will leave a copy of the presentation with BioForward, so if they would like to put it on their website, they can do that. Uh, so the question uh, was, what are the trends we've seen with combining biologics with devices, and uh, do, we, do I see any changes in how those will be regulated? Uh, FDA has an Office of Combination Products, which is responsible for deciding which center has jurisdiction over a given product uh, if there's a combination product, so a drug and a device, a uh, drug and a biologic, or a device and a biologic. And the decision is typically based on the primary function of the device. So as an example, a drug eluding stent is regulated as a stent because that's the primary function of the device. So combination products uh, present challenges for, uh, for the agency, um, even when it's easy to identify the lead center because it requires cooperation and coordination between two different centers. Often there's a culture difference um, and so the requirements for one, one aspect of the product are different than the other. And so we have been working uh, to try to provide more clarity on those uh, specific products. If someone has a particularly innovative product that's combining things in a new way or a different way, um, it definitely can be challenging both, I think, for the company and for the agency. <coughs> I think undoubtedly we will see an increasing number of combination products, uh, increasing number of biologic uh, and device combinations. I think that, uh, given the way technology is evolving, I think that is going to happen. Uh, so, that was fifteen. Our our um, our overall budget uh, at the device center is in the mid three hundred million range. Okay. Okay. Uh, but that funds also. All the inspections we do, all the pre-market review we do, uh, all the post-market surveillance we need to do. So that $15 million referred to the budget that's allocated to performing regulatory science. Okay. Um, well, I guess that's just a preamble to my question, which is it seems like maybe there's a lot more coming in the door that you guys have to take a look at and then make a decision on. Um, how do you balance that? You know, so, <coughs> so if a bad decision is made, 
who's responsible, and how do you guys as an agency decide how much scrutiny to give a specific product and to give that confidence to the consumer then that it's okay to use? So, uh, I mean, that's really the fundamental core job that we have is to make an assessment. And I, and I think, um, you know, historically, uh, we have made those decisions uh, in a bunker, if you will. We've, you know, the information comes into us. Our group and our teams have sat around and looked at the information. We'll interact with the company. We'll ask some questions and we'll make a decision. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and I think what we're saying is that's, that's not the model we want to see going forward. We recognize that we need, we need to understand what the clinical community thinks about uh, the data and the product. We want to know how patients feel about it. We issued a guidance document earlier this year about benefit and risk determination directed at our reviewers and at industry so that telling our reviewers the factors they should be considering when they're making decisions about products. We want to know what are the alternative therapies for available to that patient. Uh, if there's no alternative therapies and they have a bad disease, of course we should be accepting more risk uh, in a product. The product may not be perfect, but it may be all they've got. Uh, if the patient has a particularly uh, poor prognosis, that's different than a patient who has a superficial skin condition that's going to be fine. So, uh, so we try to be more methodical in how we assess the products. We're trying to incorporate the views of the patients and the clinical community. Um, and as I mentioned, we're trying to uh, get access to the expertise we need to make smart decisions by reaching outside of our walls. <coughs> yes, the uh, 510K process, which I think uh, probably yes, the, the 16,000 companies you had up on that slide there, probably the majority of them used to clear their products uh, for market by the FDA, has been under fire recently. Uh, institutes of Medicine had come out with a proposal to actually scrap the 510K and start over again. Uh, can you give us an update on where the FDA is currently in their thought process with the 510K? Sure. So the 510K process is the, um, the process by which we evaluate the vast majority of devices that require pre-market evaluation. Devices are divided into three classes. Class one are the lowest risk. Most class one devices we don't see. Uh, they're exempt from our pre-market review, so they're the very low risk devices. Uh, class three devices are the highest risk devices. They require what's called a PMA, a pre-market approval application, uh, typically with clinical data. And then the 510K process is about 90% of the pre-market work that we do. Not 90% of devices, because most devices are class one, but of the ones we actually look at. Uh, and that system was established by Congress and relies on a predicate device. It, it requires a manufacturer to say, I have device B, and it's similar to device A. And so, he, you know, it, and if the company can show that their device is, quote, substantially equivalent, then they get to be marketed. And if there's minor differences between the two devices, they just need to convince us, show some information or data or rationale why their device is equivalent to the device that's already on the market. We review 90% of 510K devices within 90 FDA days. I say 90 FDA days because if we have questions, there might be some time on industry's clock. But just to give you an idea of how much time we spend, uh, th they get through pretty quickly. Um, and the vast majority of those do fine. And it's a very uh, scientific evaluation process. There's no reason that many of these devices can't be evaluated that way. It's very scientific. There's uh, bench testing usually. Um, and so we have already stated we do not feel the 510K program should be eliminated. It's a very uh, efficient way for many devices. That being said, we've also acknowledged that the program could be strengthened. Our administration of the program could be strengthened, and we're working on some of those things. Earlier this year, we um, uh, issued an action plan for 25 items that we were going to accomplish in 2011. We uh, issued the plan in January, and we're almost all the way through all of those items to help strengthen the program, to provide better clarity, uh, more consistency in our decision making, implement better quality assurance programs within the agency. Um, so we're doing a lot of those things to strengthen the program. Um, so uh, there is a role for the 510K program going forward. It will not be eliminated. Um, and I think uh, it'll probably look very much like what you see, although as I said, we're um, strengthening uh, the program by trying to implement it.
Unfortunately, I have to cut the, cut the questions off. Um, Bill was kind enough to give us this whole day. He actually came in yesterday, and we uh, loaded him up with tours this morning and a business roundtable and lunch and um, a speaking engagement. And now um, we need to make sure he catches his flight so he can get back to another meeting, I think, in New York in the morning, right? So um, uh, please thank him again for uh, taking his time. And <laughs>